All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Let me get the lights uh, adjusted and whatnot. So again, if you haven't done so, go ahead and turn the, uh, the homework in up here. Um, now, I'm not going to talk in depth about the solution. I just wanted to sort of uh, uh, give you a quick overview. So remember, today I'm not accepting a late homework for this one because I'm, I'm giving you the solution right now. Okay. So um, problem one. Um, Pretty straightforward. It's all about just making sure you maintain appropriate sign conventions. You know, you've got one torque going in one direction, the other going in the opposite direction. So it's all about just making sure you're clear on that. Again, the, the book, um, instead of using J, they use I sub P, the polar moment of inertia. I use J because for circles, they're equal. J and I sub P are the same. But if you've got a non-circular section, J is its own unique quantity. So I like to use J just to sort of you know, be consistent with stuff you might see later on uh, in your careers. Uh, problem two was a power-torque relationship. Pretty straightforward. The units might have been a little bit of an issue, but it's actually a, a little simpler. Um, I, I can guarantee you that on the exam, um, I'm going to stick to uh, U.S. units for power-torque relationships, so no big deal there. But if there are any units issues, you know, we'll, you know, we'll be pretty kind on that because I know we stuck with uh, U.S. units for the examples. And problem three was a, a composite, um, a composite circular shaft, you know, a bar and a pipe. And I think this was probably verbatim very similar to an example we did in class, so it should be pretty straightforward. Um, let me go ahead and pass out this so that you all have this for your records uh, and whatnot. So here's one, two, four. One, two, three, four, five. I think you need one more. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. We got a lot of folks who, who didn't show up today. Well, th actually, no, it's only three. So, okay. All right, um, so does, uh, does everybody have a copy of the solution? Okay, all right. Let me go then and talk a little bit about this. So I prepared this uh, exam one review PowerPoint that should sort of, you know, in a nutshell, tell you everything that you need to know about uh, exam one and summarize just about, I think, all the, the pertinent information. Um, I try for that not to be the case, uh, but it depends on the test taker. Usually, um, exams in here, what I have found is that um, I, I at least have a good number of students finishing early. I try and, and for these tests not to be time crunchers. That's not the, the, the way I operate. Okay. So l let's talk a little bit about the, the format of the exam so everybody knows what's going on. Okay. So the exam's closed book and closed notes, okay? Now you're allowed a calculator and a formula sheet. The formula sheet's an eight and a half by 11. You can put whatever you want on that formula sheet. And I, um, I, I have you all make your own formula sheet as opposed to me doing it for you because what I have found is that um, when, by, by actually going through the notes, organizing your thoughts, and then placing them on a formula sheet, it's sort of forcing you to do a little bit of studying. I mean, I've, I, I, it's kind of interesting to uh, watch uh, students take exams from my vantage point. I can't tell you how many times I've seen students doing the exam not even looking at the formula sheet. Right? Because they, by, by making it, they organize all their thoughts and they just remember all the formulas. So, um, so that's why I have you all make your own. Um, uh, again, put whatever you want. The only thing I ask not to go on the formula sheet is worked out examples. And that's partly for your benefit, because especially in a class like this, you can get lost in the minutia of a given problem, and then when I ask you a different problem on the exam, it, you get the deer in the headlights look. So, you know, or, you know, procedures, formulas, unit conversions, anything like that, but no worked out examples. 
Okay. Now, a couple notes. Try and be on time. I'm going to start the exam. I'm, I'm going to plan to start the exam at eight o'clock sharp. But if everybody's here a few minutes early, we'll start early. I'm I'm pretty easy to get along with there. Um, I'll have scratch paper and I'll have a stapler. Bless you. So um, the only thing you need is a pencil, a calculator, and a formula sheet. And I don't care what calculator you use as long as it doesn't have a Wi-Fi connection. You know, if you want to bring in a calculator and you want to program every single stress formula that there is and you know how to use it, well then you're probably ahead of the curve already. So <coughs> no big deal. All right. As for the format of the exam, so I typically have four problems on my exams. Problem one will be a series of short answer questions, you know, like, you know, what is this or, you know, what does this value mean and just, you know, write a couple short answer responses. And then problems two and two through four are actually, you know, calculation based problems. I'll have three, you know, workout problems. Okay, does that make sense? Everybody good on that? Okay, so let's talk about what's covered on the exam. So I know this seems like a really long list, um, but ultimately a lot of this stuff is pretty basic and I think you'll, you'll understand. So start off, the first thing that we discussed in the class was the fundamentals of stress and strain. So I want you to be able to compute stresses and strains in very basic structures, you know, sigma equals P over A, epsilon equals delta over L, you know, load over area, change the length over the original length, stuff like that. And make sure that you understand the equations of equilibrium, you know, make sure that you understand how to cut a section and get the loads inside given components. Um, make sure that you can relevi and, or relevi identify relevant properties. Goodness, my coffee hasn't kicked in. Um, make sure that you can identify very relevant properties of a stress-strain curve. You know, if I give you a stress-strain curve, what is E? What is the yield stress? What is the ultimate stress? Make sure that you understand that. And then using that, make sure that you're, you're able to compute this stuff. So make sure that if I give you a stress-strain curve, you can tell me what E is and, and be able to compute it. That you can tell me what Fy is and be able to compute it, or sigma y, all that stuff. So sound good? And last thing, make sure that you at least have a basic understanding of a factor of safety. You know, we use it here and there and used it for discussion purposes in, our, in some of our examples. Just make sure you have a, an understanding of what a factor of safety is. Okay? Axially loaded members, okay, make sure that you can compute the response. So the load, the stress, the strain, the deformation, all that stuff. Make sure that you can understand that response and members that have either uh, constant or varying loads or cross-sectional areas. So remember the difference between whether or not you need to integrate or not. Members that are statically indeterminate, in other words, uh, internally indeterminate structures like composite columns or composite members, uh, externally indeterminate structures, you know, one where you have too many supports or something like that, and members that are subjected to thermal loads, if they're heated up or if they're cooled down. Remember, when the temperature rises, things get hot, right? I'll never let that down. Okay. Torsionally loaded shafts, make sure that you, again, can compute the response, you know, the torque, the stress, the strain, the angle of twist, uh, members with constant and varying torque or diameter. Remember, no non-circular torsional problems, so really just diameter or wall thickness, I guess I should put there. Um, members that are statically indeterminate as well, internally or externally, and make sure that you can utilize power-torque relationships. All right, sound good? All right, in addition to that, I've given you this. So, these are some relevant formulas and, and equations that might help you out. So first off, just a stress-strain curve. Make sure that you understand what's going on there. You know, you have a linear portion uh, at the very beginning until you yield. Then, you know, and get, keep in mind, this is for, you know, mild steel. We have that yield plateau where we have perfectly plastic behavior, and then we get into that strain hardening region. We begin necking, and then we uh, fracture the member, okay? Make sure, you know, you understand basic how to compute average stress how to compute average strain. Remember, this is Poisson's ratio. We have the relationship between stress and strain in linear ranges, so modulus of elasticity, um, shear modulus. Uh, we have the factor of safety as well. All right. <coughs> now, this is what I did for axially loaded members. I said that, you know, in general, the total deformation is equal to whatever mechanical deformation there is plus whatever thermal deformation that it, there is. So let's take mechanical deformation. If you have varying load or and or area, you have to integrate. If it's constant, it's just PL over EA. For thermal, if you have varying temperature, you have to integrate. If it's constant temperature, there you go. All right. Sound good? And then for uh, uh, torsionally loaded shafts, um, we have uh, varying torque and or J, you have to integrate. Constant torque in J, it's just TL over GJ. 
I guess one formula I should put on here, which I haven't, um, and you all can write it in, I'm probably going to add this to future PowerPoints, is um, that G is E divided by, you know, that uh, Poisson's ratio and modulus of elasticity, that's probably a good one to add. Okay, so uh, for our angle of twist, again, varying torque and or J integrate, constant torque in J is TL over GJ. How do we calculate maximum shear stress or maximum shear strain or shear stress and shear strain along any point uh, from the center to the edge? Um, how do we calculate J for a shaft or a pipe? There we go. And then there's uh, our power torque relationship in U.S. units. Don't worry about uh, SI. I'm not going to uh, quiz you all on, on that since we so explicitly talked about U.S. units for power torque. I'm just going to leave it at that. All right. Sound good? Bless you. Does anybody have any questions about what we've covered so far? Yes. For mesh, let's say you have a pipe. Mm -hmm. We just want to know if you have a diameter. Mm -hmm. That's how close it is, not in inches. Yep. You need to find the R. Is that just? It's to the outside. It's the R of the outside. Yes, because, because no matter if you're dealing with a, sh okay, so the question was what, how do you, what's your R if you're dealing with a pipe for getting tall max? Um, R is still from the center of the, the section to the outermost fiber, so that would be the outer radius, okay? Right, everybody good? Now, if, unless anybody has any more questions about the, the PowerPoint, here's the way I'm going to handle this. So since I'm recording it, I'm going to do my best for if you ask a question, I'll try and repeat it so that you know, it shows up in the mic. But this is the point where I kind of shut up and let you all ask what ever you want, and I will do my best to answer it, you know, to the best of my ability. I mean, I can't tell you what's on problem one, but I can help you out with concepts and, and, and try and set your mind at ease. I, I know I, this is going to sound like there's no pun intended, but I really don't want you stressed out for the exam. I, I don't mean the pun, but I'm serious. I want it to be, you know, it would be great for me if I could give everybody 100, you know. I'm, I'm probably not going to, but, you know. <laughs> I can, I, I can, but but I'm not. <laughs> no, but but I, I want you all to do well. So, so, um, so with that, the floor is yours. Whatever questions you got. Can you get back to the formula of the ratio, the E lateral over E lateral speed. Yeah. All right. right here. Yes. No exact thing here. But it's just okay. All right. Good question. All right, so let me go back to the slideshow. So the question was, try and explain Poisson's ratio a little bit, this epsilon sublateral over epsilon sublongitudinal. And let me go to the lecture notes. <coughs> Excuse me. Actually, whoa, way far ahead. Let's see. I think it's a little further ahead. Uh, there we go. All right. So the idea of Poisson's ratio is it's trying to illustrate to you how much a member, for lack of a, a, a more sophisticated term, how much a member gets skinnier in comparison to how much longer it gets. In other words, if I take this, you know, some member and I apply an axial load to it, it's going to get longer, but it's also going to get thinner, okay? So it's going to deform longitudinally as well as laterally. Now, in, instead of talking about this in, deform, in terms of deformation, we can also talk about it in terms of strain. I'm going to develop a strain this way as, a, as well as developing a strain this way. Make sense? Now, Poisson's ratio states that for a given material, the ratio of how much strain we develop laterally versus how much strain we develop longitudinally is constant. In other words, steel has a Poisson's ratio. Aluminum has a Poisson's ratio. Bronze has a Poisson's ratio, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So those are tabulated values. You can very easily look them up. Why the negative? Well, we, we would like Poisson's ratio to just come out to be a positive number, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, whatever. And if I think in terms of sign conventions, longitudinally I'm developing positive strain because the member's getting longer. 
Laterally, I'm developing negative strain because the member's getting shorter laterally. So a negative divided by a positive is a negative number. So I throw this extra negative in there to get a positive value. Does that make sense? Well, well I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, let, let me put it like this. You, here, here's how this would work. You would go down to the lab, take a piece of material, yank on it in the elastic range, measure it strain this way, measure it strain this way, and just divide the two, and there you go. Yeah, most likely I would just give you Poisson's ratio. Not to say I, I couldn't ask you to interpret it or understand what it means uh, or what have you, but, but yeah. Everybody good? Again, floor is yours. Okay. Okay, yeah. So the question was, when computing the modulus of elasticity, um, how, how do you get that from a stress-strain curve? So um, if we're looking at a problem like example four, where you were given stress-strain data, E is the slope of that curve. So that's what the curve looks like when you've plotted it. E would be the, the derivative. Now, more specifically, when we need an, an E value for the purposes of design, the E value would be the slope right here at a strain of zero. So take the derivative, set it equal to zero, and solve. That's your E value for purposes of design. That's a good question. Yes, sir. Okay, so okay, so that's a good uh, good question. So the question is, what's going on with the yield stress um, with this? There really isn't a well-defined plateau. Okay, it's not like like this, where I can say the yield stress is between B and C, and it's you know, 50 KSI, or whatever. Okay, here, it's not a very uh, straightforward um, situation. So finding the, the, finding the yield stress is, is not very straightforward, but finding an offset stress is. Okay? Now, to find the offset stress, the first step is to find E, that slope right here. Okay? All right. The next step is to choose an offset. So an offset is a particular strain value that we're going to go over on the x-axis. So it might be 0.1%, 0.2%, whatever. Usually that would be given in a problem. Calculate the 0.2% offset. Calculate the 0.1% offset, whatever. So using a slope and a point, recognizing that zero on the y-axis and whatever point O one point whatever on the x-axis, depending upon your offset, I can calculate the equation of a line. You know, y equals mx plus b, or using point slope, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Sound good? All right, so <coughs> if I have the equation of a line and I have this curve, all I've got to do is just say, okay, find where this curve and this line intersect by setting them equal to one another and solving. So if I go to... If I go to this and let's see. All right. So here's the curve in that example. The first thing that we did is found the modulus of elasticity, and we did that by taking the derivative, right? Um, so this is taking the derivative, how to use a little bit of that, you know, calculus quotient rule stuff that has probably been a little while since we've looked at. Use the quotient rule, plug and chug, and we get this. Take that derivative plug in a strain of zero, and we get an E value that we can use for design, okay? As for our offset, we know the slope of that line. That uh, point there on the uh, x-axis is 0 0.002, 0. How am I getting that? It's a 0.2% offset. So 0.2% is 0 0.002. So here's the strain, here's the stress, here's the slope, then it's you know, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, or, you know, using it in stress and strain, there's the equation of that line right there. So I have an equation of the line. I have the original stress-strain curve. Take those two quantities, set them equal to one another, right? Solve for the strain. That's the strain I get. 
take that strain, plug it back in, there's my yield stress. It's a little bit involved, but all in all should be pretty straightforward. Epsilon is strain, yes. No, 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 no. Delta is the deformation, okay? In other words, okay, that, that's a good question. So the difference between strain and deformation, okay. So let's say I have a bar that is 10 inches long, okay? And I yank on it. And I stretch it to a final length of 11 inches, okay? Make sense? All right. It's deformation, delta is 1 inch. Its strain is 10%, change in length over original length, okay? So make sure you're understanding the difference between what strain is and what deformation is. Deformation is literally taking a ruler and saying, how far did it move, okay? Strain is its percent deformation, change in length over original length. So that, that's a good point to make sure that, that you understand the difference, okay? Everybody good on that? That was for that alloy, that, uh, that curve, let me see. Um, so was this equation specific to a given problem? And the answer is yes. Um, if you remember, an engineer has provided a mathematical expression which describes the stress strain curve for a copper alloy. So that would be for a particular material. Another material, like mild carbon steel, would have a completely different stress strain curve. That's one of the beauties of stress strain curves is that by dividing out the, the geometry. I mean, it goes, it goes back to that, that example we did on day one. Remember I had the paper clip and then I, that big bar? You know, I can bend the paper clip, but I can't bend the bar, right? It's because the bar had a very significant, significantly different geometry. A stress strain curve is a way of taking the geometry out of the situation so that we're only looking at uh, data relevant to the material. So this is material uh, or data that I can use for steel and its material behavior. There would be a different curve for you know, copper alloy, for aluminum, for concrete. That's one of the beauties of this data, is that it takes the geometry out of the situation and I can look at data only relevant to that material. So I can take this structural steel and use it to design a bridge, a building, a gear, a, sh a shack, whatever. Make sense? Okay, yeah. Okay, so let's say you're given this and you need to find the E value. Just the slope of that line. To the proportional limit or to the yield stress? To the proportional limit. So you could just find that point and just say change in Y over change in X. And, okay. and remember, if you get into this range and you unload it, find a good picture of that, and you unload it, it goes back at that same slope. the load or area varies. Okay, um, I can, let, let, me, let me walk through a couple things though. We've actually done a couple already, okay? One of those was example five, okay? Now with example five, go back to, to, to remember that, that, um, that example we mentioned earlier. Let's say I'm holding a chain, like a metal chain. They're not exactly light. A metal chain can be kind of heavy, right? Now I'm pr probably strong enough that I can hold a chain that's maybe two or three feet long. A chain that's 5,000 feet long, I'm, I'm not that strong, okay? So the longer a chain gets, the heavier it gets. Make sense? All right, so what we did on this problem, uh, let me full screen this a little bit. All right, what we did on this problem, if you remember, okay, we, we started off, you know, this was just yielding stuff. This isn't really what, what we're asking about. All right, let's go into here, okay? So here what I did is since the, the, you know, the longer the bar gets, the heavier it gets, we cut a section and said, okay, you know, what's going on? Well, if I cut, you know, imagine, lightsaber or samurai sword, cut through that bar, it's going to fall, right? 
It's going to fall because there are two loads being subjected to that bar. Now, one of them was this load Q that was being applied at the tip. Okay? The other is the self-weight of the bar. So if the bar weighs 5 pounds per foot and it's 4 feet long, that's 20 pounds, right? If it's 10 feet long, it's 50 pounds. See what I mean? So it's the weight or that, that weight of the bar, that linear, you know, pounds per foot or kilonewtons per meter, however you want to look at it, that weight per foot of the bar times X. So like I said, cut a samurai sword, it's going to fall. That means inside the bar I have a load going up, right? So how to get that equation? It's just equilibrium, right? And this was that one of the first points uh, in the in the review packet, make sure that you understand equilibrium, okay? So going down, I have Q, and then I have the weight of the bar times X. I have to have the axial load inside the bar going up, okay? Now once I get this function, once I get that, it's pretty simple. It's just integration at that point. And yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's calculus, and I know you all have probably, you know, had your, you're up to your limit with all that calculus stuff limit. You're a tough crowd. All right. But um, <laughs> um, all in all, you can just take this and plug it into here. And we are talking about the integral of x. It's not that complicated, right? You know, factor out all your constants, and what's the integral of x? It's x squared over 2, right? So once you hit that point, you know, you can just go through and carry out your integrals, and then there it is. And yeah, this equation may look a little nasty, but it's plug and chug, right? Make sense? Now that's varying load. We also did one with varying area. Okay? Now here we had a constant load of 20 kips, but what we ended up having to do was, you know, cut a set, or we ended up having to define a function that, you know, represented the area. You know, we did uh, the problem in class, we assumed that the area varied linearly, and then I gave you all that handout that said, well, what if the diameter varies linearly? And let me say this. Um, I joke about calculus, but this isn't a calculus exam. I'm not going to give you some area function, you know, where the, the bar, you know, goes like this, and you have to integrate some sine function to get the, the answer, because this isn't calculus. I'm not saying that you're not going to have to use calculus at all on the exam, but if you do, it's, this isn't a calculus exam. It's going to be pretty basic, all right? If it's something, you know, that intricate, I'll probably just give you the function, you know, and just say, go with it, even then. It won't be that bad. So to please, I, I will not make this a calculus exam, I promise you. Okay? All right. Sound good? So, it, again, once you get the area function, it's just integration as usual. I mean, I'd argue even this is pushing it on the, my, my expectation of your calculus knowledge. Okay? Do I expect you to know what an integral is? Yeah. Do I expect you to pull all these different, you know, uh, transcendental integral identities? off the top of your head? No, it's not what this is about, okay? So before I, I got, did, did that help out a little bit? Okay, do you still want me to try and go through and do something else or? Okay, okay, no, it's, it's, it's fine. Okay. Um, I mean, please, you know, th again, the, the, again, this is still your time, so we got plenty of time, so I want to assuage all of your concerns as m much as I can. Okay, so what I did for this problem, uh, first off, I did it two different ways. So the question was, how did we get the equation of area? So uh, we did it two different ways. The first way is we assumed that the area linearly varies. So the area is a line, okay? So if the area is a line, here I have x equals 0 and I have a value. Here x equals L and I have a value. So I can calculate the slope change in y over change in x, and I can get y equals mx plus b, and there's your area, or there's your line. Pretty straightforward, okay? That's if the area linearly varies. Now, if the diameter linearly varies, where is it? If the diameter linearly varies, it's kind of the same story with the diameter. You just have to be a little careful with your, with your area count, because I, I have a linear diameter but then how do I calculate the area? It's pi over 4 times d squared. You, you see what I mean? So I've got to go through. Then it becomes more of a calculus-based problem. You've got to go through and recognize all your 
calculus identities and, and all of that. A little bit more, you know, integral substitution and, uh, and what have you. Does that answer your question a little bit? Everybody else good? Again, um, this is not going to be a calculus exam, okay? Even though this stuff is just so integral to everything that we do. It's a tough crowd. Tough crowd. Tough crowd. Yes, sir? Oh, <laughs> sure. If you haven't turned in your homework, go ahead and start stacking it. You, I mean, you can go ahead and walk up. I mean, again, I want this to be pretty informal. I mean, this is your time, not my time. So I want you all to be able to relax and, and ask whatever uh, questions you want. Um, let's see, hold on. I think I owe you this. Yes. Um, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, so the question was, when you're writing your equations of compatibility, um, is there a way that you can be certain? Um, let me say this. If you're dealing with something like a composite column, I would say there's really only one way of looking at it. In other words, if I've got a solid aluminum core and it's surrounded by a steel jacket, okay, and I take that uh, segment and I push on it. The deformation in the aluminum equals the deformation in the steel. There's your equation of compatibility. If I'm twisting it, the angle of twist in the aluminum equals the angle of twist in the steel. You know, that's it. For externally indeterminate you know, structures, what I would say is this. If you're dealing with a, a system where it's you know, braced on both ends, remember the ones where you've had a rigid wall over here and a rigid wall over here, something like that? Your equation of compatibility, you can pick one of those supports let's say the support over here, and say when it's all said and done, the deformation there is zero. I mean, it's not going to move. Um, if there's anything else that's more intricate, you know, like we had that problem where there was the rigid beam and there was uh, two bars supporting it. I think it was, um, um, you know, something like this. That one's a little... That takes a little bit of finesse, and, and I'll do my best to try and guide you a little bit through stuff like that, okay? Because, you know, I, I might test you conceptually a little bit, but, you know, if you had never done a problem like this before, you know, you, that might be a little tough, and I can, I can appreciate that. However, I probably will not guide you on a problem like this, because you should know that if I take that member and go like this, that however much the you know core or the brass core uh, compresses is how much the uh, uh, aluminum core compresses that should be pretty basic because right. we've done so many problems like that whether it be a an axially loaded member or a torsional shaft same story okay Does that help you out a little bit then it's not indeterminate. Then, then you don't have an indeterminate issue altogether, which is why there was that problem on the homework, um, that problem two on homework two. Remember the one I gave you all the homework in on? The solution in the book assumed it was indeterminate when it really wasn't. Because granted, yeah, you had multiple cables, but they were all steel. And because they were all steel, the stress in the cables was all the same. Okay. So all you had to do was take P over A and you had the stress in everything. And then you could go to one cable and say, well, here's the stress, here's the area, flip and multiply, and here's the load. You know, so it was a lot simpler. So if everything is the same material, then there is no indeterminacy. Now, if you wanted, you could treat it like an indeterminate problem. You would just be way overcomplicating it. But done correctly, you'd still get the same answer. Like if you had a, a two-inch steel core surrounded by a steel jacket. You could treat that as two members, a composite column, and you'd still get the same answer. You get the same stress in both of them. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, did that help answer your question? Okay. okay. About everybody else? 
Oh, I'm not. No, if you need stuff like, okay, so the question was, do we know, need to know anything about cables? If you need to know any particular section properties that are not readily, you know, computationally available, I will give them to you. There, there is on the second exam, the second exam is going to be primarily associated with bending. And one of the things you're going to need are section properties of beams, you know, particular beams like steel eye shapes and what have you. I'm not going to expect you to memorize those. I'm just going to, here's a table at the back of the test, all right? But a J for a pipe or the area of a rectangle, like, yeah, that I expect you all to be able to do. I, I know that's, that, that I mean, I'm not saying that to sound, you know, silly. But some of those I actually do expect. An area of a rectangle, that might sound, oh, I can calculate the area of a rectangle. But later on, what about the moment of inertia of a rectangle? Like, you know, that, that's a formula you really might need to remember, like BH cubed over 12, you know. So you might not remember that now. You will later, I promise. Yes. Yes. That's just the angle of twist at the end. Yes. What I did in the speech here is I just kept the angle of twist and plug the plug. The end plate is this plus the No. No, it's all equal. Because think about it like this. If I have, you know, a, 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 a torsional shaft and I twist it, the idea is that the core, tw the angle that it twists, the core twists just as much as the sleeve, okay? So you probably solved for the stresses and the torques in each segment by saying the angle of twist of the shaft equals the angle of twist of the pipe. But in the end, what they were asking for is just calculate it, just calculate the angle of twist, not add up one or the other. If you added them up, probably what happened was you got the same amount in one as you did in the other and just, you doubled it. So. If I take this and I twist it, I propose that if the shaft twists 10 degrees, the pipe twists 10 degrees as well. What you probably did is report 20 degrees. But it's not 20, it's 10. You see what I mean? Does that make sense to everybody else? Which one, which one, torsion or axial? Axial. Okay. So the question was, let's essentially review example nine. Okay. So example nine, um, the bar length was 100 inches. The cross-sectional area was two square inches. You've been given all of this data. Okay. Now this one is a, a thermal problem. But it really doesn't matter if it's a thermal problem, if it's a, 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 a problem with um, mechanical loads, it really doesn't matter, okay? So let me go to the uh, notebook here. Okay, so we start off assuming one end of the wall is free, so we remove that support on the right which, by the way, on the exam, when you're doing problems like this, if you have to remove a support, I will tell you which one to remove, okay? In other words, you would get the exact same answer if you removed the left end as opposed to the right end. Sorry. The only um, problem with that is, you know, let's say you two did the problem, you removed the left end, you removed the right end. You could both get the same answer or the incorrect answer and you did the problem two different ways, which means now I have to have two different solutions and I have to grade your problems differently. I don't want to do that. So I will do my best to guide you in the right path, you know what I mean? Just to make my life a little easier. Because uh, my structural analysis folks will tell you I'm lazy, I like to do it the easy way. So, right? There we go, okay. Um, <coughs> all right, so for this, let's re remove the support on the right. Now this is a thermal problem and it's undergoing cooling. So if I remove that support and I cool that member, it contracts, it gets shorter, okay? So I go through and I ask myself, well, how much shorter did it get? And I say, well, okay, well, the thermal um, contraction, since it's a constant temperature, no calculus, and I get negative 0.046 inches, whatever, okay? 
So then I say, all right, let's then do a second case where that temperature's gone and we yank on the wall. And I want to yank on the wall a very specific amount. How much? To generate a deflection of 0.0455, bringing it back to zero, okay? So if I contract, if, if the, the, um, the temperature variation contracts the member 0.0455 inches, and then the mechanical load brings it back 0.0455 inches, then, and I add those two results together, what I get is a temperature variation on this member that re and a reaction that results in zero deformation. So this force, this 27,300 pounds, that is the wall reaction. Okay, so you just take those results, superimpose, and solve. That's basically the long and short of it. Okay, now, does that help answer your question a little bit? Same story uh, if we were dealing with a mechanical load. In other words, instead of applying a delta T of negative, negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit, what if I took this bar up here and I pulled on it with 20 kips? Okay? It'd still be the same story. I just have to cut sections, get the forces inside the member, and then do the same thing. All right? Is that good? Y'all let me know. Any, any, any questions? Anything's on the table, and I will answer it if I can. We got plenty of time. Now, one thing about these review sessions, we do not have to literally sit here for the next, what is it, 35 minutes or whatever. I mean, we can end it whenever you want. We can keep going. It's totally up to you. You all are driving the train. Driving the, yeah, that is a good point. Then you're driving the automobile. You can hit the brakes or, or, or what have you. Yes, sir. Okay. Let me see. Let me pull it. If it's a problem two. Well, yeah, it said tubular shafts. So, yeah, I, I try and do my best to say shafts are solid circular segments and pipes are hollow circular segments. Um, and I'll do my best to utilize that language and that verbiage on the exam as well. If it's a shaft, it's solid. If it's a pipe, it's hollow. So, now if it's a composite section, it might be a solid shaft and then a pipe around it. So, yeah, but I, I do my best to try and use the same terminology. Um, and, and stuff like that happens in engineering. Sometimes we have multiple terms for the same thing. In, in structural engineering, you'll, you'll hear the term beam and the term girder used very interchangeably. Or in stringer, you'll hear beams, girders, and stringers. And they all kind of mean the same thing and they kind of don't. And <laughs> it's, I, you know, it can get confusing even to you know, structural engineers who think they're saying the same thing and they're not. Like I, I you know, try and use the verbiage that beams frame into girders. That's what I, I try and say. So girders have beams framing into them. That, that's sort of the way that, 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 uh, that I, I uh, express it when I'm talking about you know, things like building design. But that's how I do it. Another engineer may say something totally different. So. Well, I would forget, for, depending on the column you're talking about, beams and girders can frame into that column. <laughs> I, I like to think about you know, like hip bone connected to the leg bone, so on and so forth. The beams are connected to the girders. Girders are connected to maybe the columns, and columns are connected to the ground. And then that's Professor Huffman's problem. Now he's the geotech guy, so he designs the support structure under the ground. My responsibility as the structural engineer on a project like this new building would be to the ground, and then you know he takes over looking at things like consolidation and settlement and 
pile sizing and pile spacing and stuff like that. And then it would be my job to select you know, how what you know behind that little partition right there. There's a column. How big is that column? You know, what size is it? What have you? You all can keep them coming. I mean, anything. Anybody have any questions? Anything at all? I'm getting this feeling like we're starting to run out of questions, so this is something I like to do during these exam review days. You got any more questions? You good? You good? No, th this, th I, uh, this is good. Where to cut a section? Okay, that's a good question. So the, the question was, if you've got a problem, where do you cut sections? Okay, and the easiest way to state that, let me go through the example problems. Let me see if I can find a good one. Um, I've got plenty in structural analysis, but this isn't structural analysis. So. Um, actually, no, this one right here, this actually might be a good one right here, this example 12. Okay. Um, Okay. Or actually, uh, I'm trying to find out. Okay, here we go. Here's a good example. Okay. Um, usually um, on, on structural elements, whether it be a torsional shaft, a, a axially loaded member, okay, you can have a series of distributed loads and you can have a series of concentrated loads. Now, a very common example of a distributed load would be something like self-weight. In other words, all beams must be able to support their own self-weight. So let's say I have a beam, you know, there's a support here, and there's a support here, and it's a big steel beam, okay? That beam might weigh, you know, 50 pounds per foot. So it has a constant 50 pounds per foot load across the beam. So in order to capture that, I can cut a section anywhere. Okay, I can cut a section here, here. I'll still get the same load magnitude. Okay, now let's take that same beam. Let's put a you know 20 kip load right at mid span, right there. Okay, I propose that to represent those loads, I need to cut a section right before and right after. Throwing those concentrated loads onto a system, a concentrated load, a concentrated torque, what have you, they they change the load distribution. In other words, if I look at this problem. Um, uh, you know, and I've got A, B, B, C, and, and so on and so forth. I cut a section, you know, between B and C because if I move from left to the, from left to right, I'm going to get some value of torque between B and C. But as soon as I go past C, the torque's changed because I introduced that 450 foot kips right there. Okay, makes sense. You could almost argue that technically I should have cut four sections. I should have cut a section right here and cut a section right here. It wasn't really necessary though because if I cut a section here and I look to the left, there's nothing there, right? So the torque is zero. If I cut a section here and look to the right, there's no torque, so the torque is zero here. The only places that I was going to get torque was between B and C and between C and D. And since these were concentrated torques, I needed to cut a section before C and after C. So anytime you have some concentrated force, concentrated torque, you need to make sure you're cutting a section before or after. You know, if we go back to a homework problem like this, you know, we had this composite column that had a concentrated load right there, right? So I cut a section before and cut a section after. You see what I mean? So anytime you have a concentrated load, make sure you're cutting before and after. That's a simple way of looking at it. Sound good? You tell me. You got any more questions? How about you? How about you? Okay. How about you? I'm going to do everybody. Well, I'm going to do everybody other than three people because I guess there's a couple that didn't show up. Um, but that's what you get. Okay. Um, so. 
you, and, and, unless there's anybody who has any other questions, I'm perfectly fine with canceling class early. Um, you know, I'll stay you know as late as necessary. But if, if that's it, then we can go ahead and cancel it. So is everybody feeling good? Everybody feeling okay about the exam? I, I mean, it might help. And going, I mean, one, all right. Let me just say this before we before we end. You know, um, uh, he said that you might want to go through the homework problems again. That's a good idea. It's probably not a bad idea to go through the example problems again. I'm not saying, I'm not saying between now and Tuesday do every single problem that you have experienced in this entire class all at once. I mean, there is a something to be said about studying too much. But it's probably a good idea to go through both and make sure you understand. I mean, I. I I, I try and be a little surgical when I select these example problems because every example problem has a point. I don't just say, here's five torsional shaft problems and they're all the same. They're all different and they all have a particular reason okay, for, for, for being there. So I want to make sure that, that uh, I'm covering as much as I can with these example problems in as short a time as possible. So th there's some good stuff in there uh, uh, is all I'm trying to say. Everybody good? All right. So with that, I will see you all on Tuesday, bright and early. Best of luck. Uh, I will see you at the celebration. We'll see you.